everybody here. I'm so glad that uh, that you made it. And do you see that the meeting's being recorded? All right. Yes. yes. Being Who's recorded. doing that for? Is that you, Eloise, doing that? Yes. Huh? Thank yes. you. Yes. Okay. Thank uh, you so much. Uh, Jean, could there. we mute? Jean, could we mute as this so a speaker could speak without uh, mute, mute speaking? all? That's a really good idea. Everybody mute, but don't forget to unmute when it's you your. Wanna, do you want to mute all, or you want us just to mute yeah, ourselves? Yeah, yeah. Everybody should mute. Well, I'm first, so I'm not going to mute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Anna, you don't have to mute. <laughs> All right, I want to welcome everybody. Thank you for being here. It's wonderful to, to be together again. And I want to thank all the readers for participating. I'm very excited to hear all the stories and poems that are going to be a real treat for us this evening. Now, um, Anna has five poems, and so we're interspersing them. So she'll read one and then we'll go to other people and then we'll come back to Anna for another and we will do this, um, I think four times. And um, the, her last time she'll read her last two poems to us. So we'll be bouncing back and forth from Anna to everybody else. And we will begin with Anna. Thank you. These are all on the subject of climate change. And uh, the first one I think needs a little background because uh, I don't know if anybody in this area I knew much about the creek fire that, that burned in Pine Ridge near Fresno, California. And uh, there was an op-ed or an, an opinion piece in the Insight section of the Chronicle on September 5th, written by a professor of uh, writing and, uh, and uh, English. Anyway, uh, he teaches, he's a professor at, at uh, Fresno State and he lived in Pine Ridge, the town that burned, and uh, lost his home. He was a volunteer firefighter, and he lost everything. He and his wife lost their home, and most of the town burned, and, and the forest, too, within a space of just two hours. No, two days. I'm sorry, two days. So um, I thought his imagery in the, in the uh, op-ed piece was was so vivid that I wrote to him and asked him if I could have permission to borrow some of it. And so he said, yes, and uh, we corresponded a little bit. And he's really delightful. This is called the Dragon of Fire. The Dragon of Fire belched forth its hot breaths on close-knit Pine Ridge, a forested town. Most homes were leveled, but there were no deaths, except for hopes, plans, and dreams that burned down. Some bravely spoke of rebuilding again. Their roots in the community grew deep. Others were fearful and full of chagrin, expressing concern flames would come in their sleep. In wildland urban interface spaces, the conditions are radically changed. More heat and drought have transformed these places from dense forests where wildlife freely ranged. Sometimes things change and there's no going back it may be wiser to find a new tract. His uh, article was called, California is not a phoenix. Rising from the ashes isn't always such a good idea. So it's been a year since his place burned and, and they're living in an apartment in Fresno. And many people have decided not to rebuild. So it's very sad. Yes, yes, it's very tragic. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you later. And we'll go to Lynn now. All I see is Jean. <laughs> <laughs> Why do I look at you, Jean? Uh huh? Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is an excerpt from the beginning of my memoir uh, called Episodes in a Cultural Revolution which will be available early next year. <laughs> Hoppy always was my main man. Hopalong Cassidy, scion of the Wild West and early broadcast television. Along with my dad, he was my model of daring, adventure, and virility. I was completely decked out with Hoppy drag. Boots, hat, pearl-handled six-shooters, even fringed gloves and chaps. 
I practically slept in that outfit. One of the most treasured photos I have of my childhood is me in my hoppy costume, less the chaps, with hands on my gun butts and a Band-Aid on my knee. The Band-Aid wouldn't have shown, but for my mother's insistence in once again trying to force me into a dress. She had won the round on the day of this snapshot. In the picture, I look ready to take on any, any bad guy you could serve up. I suppose if my family was really paying attention or concerned about my development, they might have noticed that Hoppy was teaching me what I needed to know to be an honorable man. I shouldn't look up. <laughs> This was perhaps counterproductive if they were truly invested in churning out a young woman in the 1950s. The clash between my fantasy life as a boy and the girl in the ubiquitous skirt for school set up a deep schism. And bridging this gap has been the focus of the bulk of an adult life spent healing childhood issues. Hoppy wasn't the only costume. Today, rabidly pacifist and detesting the current warmongering administration, I reflect on the little girl dressed as a soldier, climbing through the trenches, which were later to become the infrastructure of a freeway interchange. Whatever part of my allowance wasn't squandered at the local record store on the emerging and exciting rock and roll of the time was spent in the adjacent storefront, an Army Navy surplus store. When entirely put together, my soldier ensemble included shoulder patches, ammo belts, cartridge cases, even a gas mask. Before donning our helmets and heading to the trenches, the neighborhood boys and I would even soak rags in ketchup and wrap our limbs in faux bloody bandages. What a fright we were to our mothers. But the irreconcilable part continued to be the wardrobe struggle in school each day. God, how I hated being commanded to put on the dreaded dress. It was contrary to everything I was about in my mind. On the home front, all my peers and playmates were the neighborhood boys. The girls wanted to do stupid things like dress up dolls and play house. When I got home from school each day, it was like a scene from Superman, another favorite TV hero, stepping into a phone booth and ripping off his street clothes to assume his accustomed identity. I couldn't wait to tear off that dress and get back in my jeans. Everything about the school outfit made a liar out of me and my true identity as a boy. Every birthday until I sprouted breasts, my wish upon the candles was that I would awake in the morning and be male. Breasts pretty much ruined that dream and I think at that point I liked my birthday just a little less. I remember a babysitter we had, a mere neighbor girl, who refused to take me along on an outing to the movies to see 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea unless I put on a dress. I held out, but so did she. And to this day, I've never seen the film. Who did she think she was to try and exert parental control? And anyone you ask who knew me at the time would tell you that the very term parental controls was an oxymoron. There was very little in my life that had the stamp of parental direction. Ask Mrs. Murray, who twice busted me for my fascination with risky elevations. When I was just two, she called in a panic to tell mom I was atop my dad's 50-foot ham radio tower. The tale is legendary in the family mythology. Mother came out into the yard to retrieve me from the tower, and as she began to climb, she reports I growled out. I can get down by myself. I did. Next morning, when I ventured into the yard for a repeat of my aerial feat, the bottom rungs of the tower ladder had been removed by my dad to prevent any recurrence. I stormed into the house and demanded, summoning as much authority in my voice as possible at two, who took my steps? Six years later, the very same nosy, I suppose well-meaning neighbor called again, this time to wrap me out for being atop a pile driver adjacent to the ongoing freeway construction. Same old story, only this time I was put on KP to do dishes for the next six months. 
But for the most part, I flew under the radar, disappearing for entire days until time to return to the supper table. If my father was traveling on business, a frequent occurrence, even that family ritual was barely observed. I remember hanging out in the garage of an elderly neighbor, neighbor while he tinkered at his workbench. When he attempted to shake his shadow by inquiring, don't you need to get home to dinner? I informed him that when my dad was out of town, we didn't eat dinner. My mother would have blanched if she'd heard this. Then again, it would be more characteristic for her to sadly wag her head and shrug her shoulders. I think that's where I was going to stop. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, I've had the pleasure of reading her entire book and it's coming out soon. And I, I, uh, I, I strongly advise everybody to read it. I highly recommend her book. It's an exciting read. <laughs> it truly uh, is. It truly is. And on to Gail. Thank you, Jean Gregory. You're welcome. It is such Gail. a pleasure to see so many people. This time it was so few, and now it's just like, oh, it's like a lovely, lovely sight. Okay. So this is a poem called Carrying the Corn. So beloved is corn that Mayan women wove bags to carry the life-sustaining golden goddesses sheathed in green. The great tasseled stalks float above the fields in the harvest time. Between the rows, the women sing to the corn, to the ones who created this world, to the ones who come again, to the ones they trust who will not fail them. Where do we sing now? Along the aisles of Safeway, the local grocery? Only in the small tender gardens do we hear voices that lilt above the green. The colors of the corn bags, earth tones, teal, plum, sea green, grass green, cerulean sky blue, turquoise blue, yellow sun orange of the harvest moon. Carry the corn to the fires, to the tables, to the bowls, to the hungry who are waiting. Can we do as much? What songs are we singing? What harvest dances dance to stir the ground into fertility when we have forgotten the words and the music, when we can no longer remember the feel of dirt? Of this dirt we are made, stardust that generated life on earth. Do you know that we love you, whisper the bending corn stalks as each woman twists free the cob and places it in the bag beside the others? Do you know that I am part of you? Do you know that my destiny is to live again in you as you live again in me? There are other holy sisters, bean and squash. Take them along. This is the reciprocity of co-creation all creation together united in the great corn bag. We sow, we reap, we bow, we bend, we kneel, we reach up, we take down. We wander from dawn to dusk. When our hands touch the rounded bodies of corn, beans, squash, we say, we love you too. We say, thank you. We say, welcome to your generous sky water dirt dreams that feed our lives. Let us grow life into community, not just myths, legends, tales, but in our daily hours, walking on the ground in the open air divine day. Not having to ask why, but knowing the answers are in the movement of our bodies, our voices connecting. As the women sing and dance between rows of corn, as the sun sets in the hollows of the great beauty woven bags, as the night gently places a dark mothering blanket over the women, over the earth, over sisters and brothers who are hungry, who are waiting to be fed. Mm, beautiful. Oh, really beautiful. oh, wow. That is so beautiful. 
And you know, the reciprocity of co-creation is what we're doing tonight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think that. Thank you. Thank you for that beautiful poem, Gail. Oh, take a breath. <laughs> and we'll move on to uh, Earl. Earl, who has a piece on memories. Okay, this is going to bring back uh, a lot of different periods of time, but I hope you'll enjoy it. Memories. Some years ago, on a quiet and rainy Saturday, I decided to go through a box in the study closet labeled family history. I soon found a class picture of my class of my classmates back in April 1950, when I was in Mrs. Buckham's first grade. The picture had been somewhat bust and torn, almost, almost as if saving it had been an afterthought. Even after 60 years, I was able to recognize most of the kids, each one occupying one small square. I did not find my picture. I was no doubt sick with another one of those unending bugs small children come down with. There was a picture, also a picture of our teacher, Mrs. Buckham, who I think looks a bit like Karen Carpenter, and the principal of Haven School, Mrs. Vermeer. My uh, classmates became my friends over the next 12 years. Several years ago, weeks ago, I received an email from a member of my high school class. Don wanted to know if I would join him and other guests for dinner at Spenneker's in Sausalito to plan our, the 60th anniversary reunion of our Piedmont High School class of 1962. I accepted, even though going would mean running a gauntlet of heavy commuter traffic. Don had already invited about 15 others, many of whom I was eager to see. As we ate, we talked of many things, the impact of COVID, getting our shots, and the newly recommended booster. We began discussions about organizing the reunion with a multitude of questions. What kind of venue should we uh, have the reunion in? How many people might come? Should we have a meal? Should uh, we hold it in the spring, summer, or fall next year? Should we have it on a weekend or a weekday? Already, uh, some of the group have begun checking out various venues in the East Bay, including Claremont Country uh, Club, the Piedmont Community uh, Center, the Berkeley Tennis Club, and a new uh, facility at Hampton Field in Piedmont. So far, nobody has suggested returning to the uh, Courtyard by Marriott in San Francisco, where we had our 50th reunion. I agreed to create a new book of classmate memories, including shared uh, stories and updates from uh, contributing classmate, memories of deceased classmates, and a contact list. I had previously, previously done it for our 30th, 40th, 40th, and 50th reunion. Since I enjoyed doing it so much, I volunteered to do it again. Ron agreed to be our treasurer again, just like before. Our previous reunion chair decided she did not want to be in charge again. It, it is too soon to uh, say how it will all work out, but my, but my experience tells me that it will be a success and that most people in the class will try to come. Over all the years we, we have been here, we have made success a habit. We began long ago in Mrs. Buckham's class and other first grade classes, now distant memory. How grateful I am to, that I was born in the time and place I was. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And um, isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth, Earl? I just think that we are the lucky generation. We came through so easily. College was affordable. Housing was affordable. Jobs were plentiful. We just came through at a really, yeah, really wonderful we, time. You skipped the bugaboo Vietnam. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We had we had our, our pitfalls, that's for sure. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. But I like uh, how you've made success a habit. Yeah, that's good. 
And I, and I didn't know, Earl, until tonight that you and I started first grade the same year and graduated from high school the same year. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> what, was that 1962? Well, yes. 62. Yeah, me too. That's my, my timeline also. That's what I think of, Jean. Uh-huh. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Earl. And on to Kathy with her piece on gratitude. Gratitude. I am grateful for so very much in spite of the COVID outbreak and lockdown for 16 months until two months ago when we still had to wear face masks inside. Actually, I have thrived during the COVID pandemic. I am grateful to be healthy. I am grateful for Zoom, which has allowed to, me to be in contact with so many people and events. During the lockdown, I Zoomed with my Thursday morning Stitchers group. Now we are happily back together. I still Zoom with my Knitters Crocheters group that, joined, that I joined in about uh, 2008 by way of taking, uh, uh, talking on a hike and hooking up with Barbara's church group. She has come to my house occasionally to pick up what I have uh, crocheted. With Zoom, I finally met the group, some of whom have moved away. I still Zoom with the MPC Indigenous Interest Group once a month since the pandemic started. We have been studying North American Indians in general. And two weeks ago, we decided to focus on the Chenyo Alone. We brainstormed many, many people to contact who might be able to help us. Before Linda and I started the group, I rarely thought of Indians. Now every magazine I read has an article about Indians. I have gotten several books on Indians from Amazon. I am grateful for the opening of my eyes to new people and customs. I am grateful that I have been able to stay in contact with MPC people via Zoom, uh, Sunday services, and family hour. The family hour is dwindling since MPC started in person. We plan to go to church when the weather is okay, but Zoom is so convenient. Now I've decided to go to, I want to go to church December 5 and pick up a, a cookbook. I'm grateful for getting involved with the Earth Care Committee since it has been on Zoom. When it becomes in person, I will have to drop out because Earl is not interested in joining the committee and he drives me. I am grateful for Suzanne Jones for urging MPC people to take actions in various forms regarding the environment. I have written several letters and postcards to state and federal officials regarding the environment and other issues. Thank you, God, for the beauty that lures me out on daily walks. I am grateful to Earl for driving me to Oakland once a week to garden at my sister and her husband's and my nephew, Tom, who live next door to each other. But that's another story. <laughs> When my sister Sharon gets off work, she drives me back to Rossmore, first going to water aerobics for an hour and then home. I am grateful for emails and the web. I am grateful for so much. Thank you, God, for all of your creation. Thank you. You made it, Jane. Thank you, thank you. You're so moody. There you go. Okay, thank you, Kathy, for for sharing quite an impressive list of gratitude. <laughs> yeah, I like um, for uh, what do you say for keep for opening my eyes for opening my eyes. You know these these books and articles that you're reading, and I think 
that's a good model for us as we continue through our lives, keep opening our eyes to, to new things and be receptive. Thank you. Okay, we're on back to Anna for another poem. Climate crisis. Team Greta Thunberg sounded the alarm. Nations must desist from causing more harm to our ailing earth, its water and lands, before degradation on earth expands. Some doubt there's a climate emergency. We must convince them of the urgency before we humans and wildlife perish in a slow death of all that we cherish. Earth would continue its spinning in space, Life forms could vanish with barely a trace. We must bravely face what could be our fate before all is lost, we acted too late. If all nations of the world would unite, there might yet be time to avoid our plight. With that, September 26th. <laughs> if only, if yeah. only we could unite. Yes. Thank you, Anna. And we will be back to you, but now it's on to Babs. Hi, everybody. Love like Llewellyn. During my adult life, I have often felt deep gratitude for a myriad of things, but gratitude on a conscious, wider and frequent scale developed after my mother's death. I believe it was triggered as I began reading hundreds of love letters between my parents found when clearing out her belongings. In reading them, my perspective shifted to understanding them as real people, not just as parents. It was my mother who excelled in thoughtfulness, consideration and planning ahead to make things happen, to turn her dreams into a path for successful action. This new insight has allowed me to reflect on her influence on my life, who I am and my interests. She was a saver, rarely spending on herself. She made all of my clothes out of financial necessity until I was about 12 when my whining became too insistent to ignore. This and so many of her sacrifices, as well as the model for my behavior, helped me buy my home today. She was extremely curious about people in general, but also other cultures and the world, near and far. We always had National Geographic in the home. Reading about Jane Goodall in the chimpanzee research prompted my deep interest in Africa. I, I have now personally met my heroine twice and have traveled in 11 African countries. Because she verbalized her travel dreams, I was also able to make it happen enriching my life in ways I never could have imagined. When I was growing up, classical music was always playing in our house, to my great dismay. I preferred Elvis, then Motown, then the Beatles. But now I recognize and melt into the sounds of Tchaikovsky, Debussy, Copeland, Chopin, Rachmaninoff, and others. It soothes my soul, needed more than ever in today's turmoil. She loved art, and after I left home, she took classes. I was exposed to it at an early age. I now have a relatively knowledgeable appreciation for famous artists and have seen their works in some of the greatest of museums. But she also modeled appreciation for what is often called the small things, most often nature and its wonders. 
beauty and benefits of trees, the fragrance of a rose, a bird in flight, and even a weed's miraculous struggle to emerge from a crack in the concrete in order to survive. But her greatest gift to me, for which I carry the greatest gratitude, is she showed me what love is. And in loving me, showed me how to love others. I try to put that into practice every day, the best way I can. I live in gratitude because of her. My gratitude is for her. Next week, she would have been 101. I say to everyone tonight, love like Llewellyn. Wow. Oh, thank you. And, and, and love is the greatest of all these. Love is the greatest. Thank you. What a loving tribute. Thank you, Babs. Thank you. Along with her pecan pie, I'll be making next week. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole lot of love. <laughs> I, I make a pie every year in her honor. Because oh. that's what, because her birthday's at, at Thanksgiving, and we oh. always had pecan pie, and she oh. really made a great pecan pie. Yeah. <laughs> what was the date of her birthday? The 26th. Oh, my mom is the 29th. Uh, <laughs> uh -huh. Same same time of year. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Babs. And now we're on to Bet. Thank you. This story is called The Ghost of Thanksgiving Past. My favorite part of Thanksgiving Day as a child was eating leftover turkey sandwiches for supper. I always made mine with white meat, mayonnaise, and cranberry sauce on white bread. <laughs> Others preferred the open-faced version with dark meat and hot gravy on top. The early part of the day was usually characterized by various kinds of stress invoked by the preparation of a big meal, which had to be just so, and it required a lot of special cooking techniques that were trotted out just for this occasion. My parents were not the kind to plan ahead in any level of detail. And so there were always last minute crises arising at a time when there were few avenues of recourse in those days, not even grocery stores were open on holidays. Cries rang out all through the preparation. Where's the large roasting pan and rack? What are we gonna to use to close up the turkey? What? This turkey came without any giblets inside. How do we know when the turkey is done? Do we have a meat thermometer? How long do we let it rest? Where's the cookbook? Oh no, these yams should have gone in the oven an hour ago. I guess we can have them for dessert. Anyway, you get the picture. I never felt very confident that the meal would be successful or even safe to eat. Hence the feeling of stress. Still, there were many friendly, many fondly remembered moments in my family's Thanksgiving celebrations. And even the predictability of the chaos was somewhat comforting. I remember waking up to the sounds of my parents in the kitchen, my mother stuffing the turkey and my father helping to put it in the oven. Later, there would be a lot of grunting and groaning when it came time to turn the turkey. Thanksgiving was one of the few times when my father had specific culinary duties, putting the turkey in the oven, turning it, carving it, and there was something reassuring about his being there to do those things. As I got older, I took on certain tasks at which I became <clears throat> recognized as an expert, most notably making the gravy. I had to make two kinds, one with giblets and one plain. Among our eight children, there was a range of tastes. 
Heaven forbid there be mushrooms in anything. There had to be two kinds of yams, one with marshmallows on top, one without. Some people preferred smooth jelly cranberry sauce. Some people wanted whole cranberry sauce. Fortunately, turkeys come with light and dark meat, breasts, wings, and thighs, enough variety to please everyone. At our house on Thanksgiving, everyone got to have it their way. Mashed potatoes were something we all liked. I don't remember what we did for a green vegetable. It's possible that appetizers of carrot and celery sticks, olives and pickles sufficed. My father was of German ancestry and we always had sauerkraut with Thanksgiving dinner. Our friends thought that was weird, but it wouldn't be Thanksgiving without the sauerkraut. After slaving over the meal for eight hours or so, we demolished it in less than 20 minutes and took a break before moving on to dessert. During this time, we cleared the table and then either took a walk around the block together or played a game of basketball or touch football. One advantage of having a large family is that you can feel the team without having to involve outsiders. Although we rarely did that except on Thanksgiving. When we got home, the females of the family would do the dishes and the males would either nap or watch TV. Dessert was pumpkin pie with or without whipped cream. And then we brought out the cards and board games and played until it was time for a supper of turkey sandwiches, made your way. As an adult, I had many variations on the Thanksgiving theme, ranging from hosting 20 to 25 people at my house for a traditional meal with all the trimmings to bringing the vegetarian entree and mushroom gravy to a friend or family member's house. But my favorite Thanksgiving in recent years was the time my sister and I took my mom to South Lake Tahoe. Whole Foods Market had just opened a store there and they had all the elements of Thanksgiving dinner in the hot food bar. We went home, we went through the line and piled up our to-go containers with our favorite dishes, took the food home and ate with delight. There was no stress, no cooking, very little cleanup, and everyone had it their way. Thank you. Oh, how delightful, yes. <laughs> Memories of, of past Thanksgivings. And what are you doing this one? Uh, this one, I'm going to my friend Karen's house for a vegetarian Thanksgiving and then the next day we're going to go for a nice all-day hike. Oh, okay. Some, some, a variation. All these variation. different variations. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Okay. On to Melinda. Thank you, Jean. This one was a Thanksgiving to remember. Aunt Mildred, whom we mostly called Aunt Mickey, was one of those aunties who lent herself to good nature ribbing because she definitely had some quirks. Thanksgiving Day, 1974, the whole family packed up to go camping at McGrath State Beach. By whole family, I mean my husband and I and our dog Fairfax. 1974 was BC, before children. My mom, my stepdad, and 11-year-old brother, and their dog, Butchie, he was really named Stainbrook, but we called him Butchie. My mother-in-law and her dog, Girl. My older brother, his wife, and two young sons, no dog. Uncle Larry, my mom's brother, and Aunt Mickey, and their two daughters, and their dog, Pepper. In addition, Mickey's brother and sister-in-law and my then 80-something-year-old grandparents came for the meal, but stayed in a nearby hotel rather than camping out. We were all gathered on the beach around the picnic table with great hopes that blustery Thursday afternoon. Now, one of Aunt Mickey's quirks was that she carried about with her an unwieldy fear of germs. It had gotten in her way and others, other people's way on numerous occasions. It may have had to do with her having done a stint as a nurse in our old family doctor's office, Irving J. King. 
Something about Staphylococcus made her cockeyed. The whole of our camp out Thanksgiving feast was potluck. Aunt Mickey was in charge of the turkey and stuffing. So she cooked that turkey without stuffing it because who knows, that could magnetize dread salmonella bacterium and sicken, sicken us all so we'd croak right there at McGrath State Beach. I can see the headline, entire family and dogs wiped out by bad turkey Thanksgiving day. Didn't happen. Uncle Larry carved that turkey at home and well, they froze that turkey meat in neat foil packages and auntie planned to warm it up and make stovetop stuffing, which she did from a box over the camp stove in about three minutes flat. It was November, we were at the beach. The wind had blown our tents down the night before. We were all hypothermic, it was freezing. Mama Freddie, my mother-in-law had brought some pot roast, bless her, and it was warm and fragrant. The turkey never quite thawed out. The stove top stuffing came in fourth out of the three entrees. It tasted like the cardboard box from which it came. No one ate it. We put it down for the, for the dogs. Girl, Mama Freddie's dog walked over, sniffed it and walked away. Now this was a dog who ate horse plop from the equestrian center trail near her apartment. This is a dog who would eat anything that was not chained down. My beloved husband called her a silly posturpedic mattress with legs. Our dear Fairfax dog took a sniff, also walked away, which was not altogether unexpected. Mark says Fairfax was an old man at a dog suit. There were many foods from which he walked away and with such attitude. What, you expect me to eat that? A dog wouldn't eat that. He forgot he was a dog. Next up was Pepper, Aunt Mickey and Uncle Larry's dog. Same story, a sniff and a walk. Stainbrook, Butchie, my mom and stepdad's dog, bless his short-legged corky heart, walked over to that stovetop stuffing, nosed it a bit, then lifted his back leg and peed on it. <laughs> He scooted dirt over it as he walked away. He christened it inedible for all the world to see. Even Aunt Mickey had to laugh at that. We were roaring till tears came with laughter that nearly froze on our cheeks. <laughs> when our children were growing up and at bedtime would beg us to tell them family funnies, this story was among their favorites. And that is the end of that story. I have never heard a Thanksgiving story like that, Melinda. <laughs> we did a lot of camping. Usually it wasn't so blustery. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe be spared from cardboard tasting stuffing. <laughs> yes, indeed. They My dog speak. Kiva is probably is right now is probably wanting to eat some of that stuffing, no matter what it was like. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, you Linda. <laughs> all right and we're we're back to Anna for another poem in defense of earth divine action created earth's beauty bestowing stewardship as mankind's duty. No other planet in our solar sphere is endowed with resources we're blessed with here. Vast oceans, lakes, and meandering streams give us landscapes that exceed our best dreams. Yet we plunder, pollute, despoil Earth's features and mindlessly slay her endangered creatures. Oil drilling and plastics share much of the blame for dying sea life and forests of flame, for glaciers and permafrost melting away, and stronger hurricanes seem here to stay. Carbon sequestration could turn things around, restoring it safely under the ground. 
I read that our industrial food system emits about half of global greenhouse emissions and that traditional tilling exposes matter in soil to oxygen, which, which aids decomposition, releasing carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. So if we could learn to bury a lot of these carbon emissions under the ground, it, it would really help to turn things around. It's interesting how you put uh, all this information in poetic form. Well, it's, it's my discipline during COVID, trying to write a sonnet. <laughs> uh, you're quite gifted, Thank you. Anna. Thank you. All right, Sharon. She needs to unmute. Unmute, Sharon. Sharon, you need to unmute. You're muted. I didn't know I was on mute. All right. There you go. Have you ever heard of Sedna? She's the goddess of the sea and surf. And she is a great protector of the ocean and the mother of the great sea mammals, the walrus, the whale, seals, and the dolphin. She loves these animals deeply because she is their mother. All of these giants were transformed from her fingers. She gave her fingers for the birth of the, each animal. She is honored by the Inuit, the people of the northern coast of what we now call North America. Senda is rumored to have tremendous power and great wisdom. For years I have searched for her, hoping to communicate with her and hear her stories. Now I am desperate hoping to have answers for the careless destruction and wrecking of our waters. And so I tell you a story, a story of an amazing mystical meeting with the sea goddess. I had traveled for miles along the coast of Canada and Alaska, searching, searching, and then one day at dawn, an unusual cold, crisp day for a warming planet, I found her on a quiet, isolated cove. She answered my call. She emerged from the icy water and struggled to climb a rock. Her long raven hair was matted and tangled. I saw the stubs of her fingers twisted and torn. And I stared. She turned toward me and seemed to wait for me to speak. Finally, I had the courage to speak to the old woman. Our people are lost and afraid. Sedna speaks. Yes. Dear daughter, I see it all. The humans, your people, are befouling their nest, their source. You are spitting out vile poison into the atmosphere. I see it all. The breaking off of great ice sheets in the Antarctic, the rising oceans, the constant storms, tornadoes, hurricanes, the heat that is threatening the lives of the animals that I love, both on land and sea, the animals suffer and disappear. There's a great swarm of plastic that rides in our ocean, making a blanket that smothers sea life. Can't you see the ominous threats to our great waters? They are becoming polluted and toxic. 
are very so Sharon, you're muted again. You'll have to unmute again. It looks as if we lost. Yeah, she, she got muted again. I think the cat did it. Yeah, you're still muted, Sharon. The little red microphone with the line through it. Yeah, I, I don't know what the problem is. You can't unmute, Sharon? Deborah, did you wrote a text saying that you bumped, that you accidentally clicked on something. Have you been able to unclick that? <laughs> Who's the host? Um, I, I, Eloise, are you the host? Uh, I can't unmute Sharon. She has to unmute herself. Mm. Sharon, go on your own image and find the little blue box in the corner. No little blue box? Upper, uh, upper uh, right hand corner. She yeah. got it. That did it? Yep, yeah, that's it. Oh, good. That do it? Yeah. Yep, you're back. Yay, thank you everybody. I'm sorry. Get, uh, just go back a, a paragraph so we can pick it up again. Can't you see the ominous threats to our great waters? They're becoming polluted, toxic, our very source of life. The temperature is rising. I see it all. I answer, help me, help us all. My heart and mind are deeply troubled. I'm in anguish. I'm tired to death of trying to be optimistic. Where do we go with our sorrow? How do we continue with this pain? What do we tell our children, our grandchildren? What kind of world will they inherit from us? Sedna, oh ancient one, show me a glimpse of hope for the future. How do we heal our great divide and face the denial of so many? Help me keep my feet on the ground. There is silence after my plea. I fear that Sedna will ignore me. Finally, she speaks. Don't pretend that everything is all right. I beg you. Her voice is raw, cracking. You must change your way of life. You must return to a more simple way of living. You must again honor your source, your beautiful home. You must speak up to protect life. You must speak for those who have no voice. Stop pretending, I beg you. If you know the truth, even a corner of the truth, stand up and shout it. That's the word. Sedna turned away from me and slid back into the sea. In the distance, I saw a great whale breach the waters. Oh, Sharon, such a passionate plea. <laughs> I think uh, we all, we all feel that. I think, I think you're speaking for all of us. Thank you for meeting with Sedna. I appreciate that journey that you took. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, 
another breath and we will return. Uh, no, we will go on to Tom. Tom, it's good to have you with us back from. Thank you. As I explored cities and towns of southern Spain's autonomous region of Andalusia this fall, I encountered an, an emotion-filled personal connection with history. One example was in the city of Osuna, walking Calle San Pedro, said to be one of the most beautiful streets in Europe. As a local once wrote, Osuna is a stunningly beautiful town. San Pedro is a street to beat them all. Nobles flocked to Osuna hundreds of Wait. I don't know why it unmuted or muted again. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Where did I leave off? San Pedro Street. Uh, okay. San Pedro Street is a street to beat them all. Nobles flocked to Osuna hundreds of years ago and vied to have the most exquisite palace. It is beautiful, but it unveiled a dark history that tore at my heart. It was surely built with wealth plundered from the Americas around the same time that my ancestors from Osuna were abandoned by Spain. I visited because my earliest identified Spanish ancestor in the Americas was a soldier of the Spanish conquest, Juan Ismerio de Osuna born in present day Mexico in 1745. Was it his father who first came from Osuna or grandfather or great grandfather? I do not know. What I do know is he arrived in present day California in 1769 and along with his California born son, Juan Maria Osuna were founders of what became modern day San Diego. Indeed, the son was among those who petitioned for Pueblo status in the 1830s, built the first house, and was elected alcalde, clumsily translated as its first mayor. Most Spaniards who came to the Americas, like my ancestors, were ordinary Andalusians. Their culture, shaped by eight centuries of Islamic rule, during which time Muslims, Catholics, and Jews learned to live together in relatively har har relative harmony before the rise of the Catholic monarchs, Ferdinand and As Isabella. These Andalusians in early California had a hard life. Starting in the early 1800s, a mere three decades after they arrived, the Spanish empire began crumbling. On a far frontier of Spain, they were increasingly isolated ultimately even cut off from Spain's financial support. Juan Maria Osuna began farming in addition to his military duties to put food on the table for his growing family. Then came the Mexican Revolution, Mexico winning independence from Spain in 1820 before the 450 occupants of San Diego even knew the war was being fought. As described by Rita Larkin, editor of the Journal of the San Diego Historical Society in the 1960s, the new government in Mexico City had inherited a frontier outpost with dilapidated fortifications, soldiers with no uniforms and no supplies. These San Diegans, she wrote, had been isolated for so long that they felt no emotional attachment to the Spanish government. Thus, they fell back on the law, the language, the religion, and the customs inherited from their long Andalusian culture. In 1831, Osuna and 13 others staged an open revolt and overthrew the then governor of Alta, California. When a new governor was appointed, they petitioned and were granted Pueblo status. Osuna was elected alcalde and commenced governing in ancient Arab fashion. Even his name and that of California itself are both believed by scholars to have originated from Arabic words. 
according to Larkin, Santiago Ar Ar Arguello, then commandant of the Presidio of San Diego, installed Osuna in office. Arguello did this by giving the new mayor his staff of office, a cane of light wood with a knob of silver or gold. Juan Maria never appeared in public without this cane. This was in line with a very old tradition. As alcalde or village judge, he was inheriting a position which originated in the Arab Moorish invasion of Spain in 711 AD. Osuna was the sole arbiter of local disputes, even those within families. Such duties must have required great patience and tolerance by Osuna, my Andalusian fourth great grandfather. So it does, does not surprise me that a few generations my, my, later, my grandfather, Teofilio Barker, Barker, was a man whose patience and tolerance was a major influence on his daughter, my mother, which she taught me to admire and respect. Nor is it now, excuse me, nor is it a surprise now that I have visited Spain and learned much that I was put in Catholic school that served a multiracial and multi-ethnic population. Black children, long before there was a political uproar in public schools over busing, were bused from a neighboring parish. Not once did I witness my mother do anything but respect that. Nor can I call her, recall her ever describing a child of a different race or ethnicity with anything but respect. And she never tried to influence my choices of childhood friends. Thus, as I realized one day while walking in Spain, among my very best friends were a Jew, a Mexican, and a Syrian. Coincidence? I think not. And I marvel at the generational and historical forces that I now know helped shape me. That's, that's, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Mm -hmm. Oh, very interesting. This walk through your personal history and the centuries. Very, very interesting, Tom. Yeah, and it's just, uh, you know, six minutes uh, covering <laughs> how many centuries and, and a, a, lot of, a, a lot of other experiences in Spain <laughs> that inform this that I'll eventually get around to writing about. <laughs> Well done, Tom. Well done. Thank, Thank you. you. May I make a, a comment that the Osuna name has gotten around and one of my high school friends, Randy Osuna, was very uh, prominent in Belmont High School, LA. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. We're, Randy we're undoubtedly cousins somewhere back there. <laughs> <I think so. laughs> hey, we're Tom. when we need it. Could you spell the name again? Or I'm hearing Osuna. Is it spelled O S U N A or with two O? Uh huh. Yeah. And and was this the name of the town as well as it? The name of the town came from this man. Uh, well, no, his name came from the town. The the uh, oh. the original names were De Osuna, which meant of Osuna. Yes. Okay. Uh, and and what is it closest to in Andalusia? Uh, it's it's sort of midway between um, um, Cordoba and uh, Sevilla. Okay, so it's not on the coast then. Okay. No, no, it's it's way inland and it's surrounded by more olive trees than I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, I was there. And, mm -hmm. and so I was just interested because I've got a map of Spain. I'd like ah. to find. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we will return to Anna for the final time this evening. Anna, you'll have to unmute. We seem to be having some trouble with muting. <coughs> there we go. Now, okay, okay. Uh, I wrote these 
these two sonnets, uh, well, actually they were two. Well, the first one is about rain again. And uh, I was so excited to hear rain. I hadn't really heard any in two years. Rain is battering roof and window pane. What a blessing it is to hear it again. With only five inches in Oakland last year, prolonged extreme drought was my haunting fear. The wind sways boughs of liquid amber trees arrayed in bright colors adorning their leaves. Does this early rainstorm promise more ahead? It may take years to see reservoirs fed. Fresh snow might store water to serve our needs if runoff is sent to streams that it feeds. Rains are helping to extinguish wildfires caused by lightning or downed electric wires. May this rainy season be bountiful, restoring forests with rain that is ample. Well, that was maybe, I don't know, maybe one in the afternoon when it first hit. And then it just kept raining and raining. It was the hardest rainstorm I've ever seen on my street. Uh, Uh, the hardest rain I think I've ever seen on my street. And Surrey Lane is a really wide street. And the, it was like a rushing river, a torrent. You could barely see the crest of the road. And you couldn't see a hill across the street. It was raining so hard. It, it was just insane. So this is rainstorm mixed emotions. My mood careened from elation to fear. The enchantment of rooftop drops raised hope of ending our estrangement from rain last year. The storm was unleashed and I feared for my slope. Torrents cascaded down the steep incline as darkness drew near and prediction became fact. Half of the land behind the fence is mine. Would the hill hold and the fence stay intact? In the blackness, I sensed the tempest's full force. Could my long dormant sump pump awaken? I'd face, I'd face storms alone after my divorce, now this fiercest one since Victor was taken. It becomes much harder to live here alone. Should I make a move soon or can I postpone? So, I couldn't see what was happening because it was so dark and all night I was worried about it. But in the early light of morning, I noticed my fence was still standing and uh, there were grooves in the hillside where the waterfalls came down. And so just last Saturday, I had to have my gardener put down this jute uh, network uh, all the way down from the top of the steep slope, which wasn't really my property, but, but that's where it was starting. So he had to use these long strips of jute netting to try to uh, prevent erosion. And so I had to go meet my neighbor on the street behind me and, and talk to her because the drain was all stopped up with rocks and leaves and branches. And so I, I've got to talk with her again and see if they fix the problem. <laughs> So that's my experience within 24 hour time. The, the rain, the double edged sword, such a difference from the first poem to the second poem. Yeah. Like so delighted with the rain. And then you got so worried about the storm. Yeah. I haven't had to worry about that in years. Well, my sump pump did work and my drainage system, my French drain was working well and I didn't smell mold under my house. So I'm crossing my fingers because well, good. good that, then I'm in good shape. <laughs> good, good. Thank you, Anna, for sharing those wonderful poems with us tonight. And our last reader, so patiently waiting her turn is the dessert of our feast tonight. Mm -hmm. Margaret, you're on. Jean, I also see that Tom Ilkema sent a, a chat that he's back and he could read something too. Somebody is questions. muting us. That's what's happening. I got a notice that somebody is muting everybody. That's why I got cut off. 
Okay. And that's why we can't hear Margaret because somebody, one of the people here is muting us. It was a one-time thing with um, Deborah accidentally. Well, it's happened more Can than that. <laughs> Can you hear me now? There's Margaret. Yes. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. I didn't have to get Kevin. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, does Tom? Does Tom want to uh, uh, read something? Tom Elkema. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thank you. It's fine with me if he wants to read something. Okay, Tom, you go ahead, and then we'll put on Margaret after you. Yes, yeah, Margaret's the one who wraps everything up for us. <laughs> <laughs> While living in Panama, I received a call from my friend, Ann Scott, the Associated Press correspondent. She asked me if my wife and I would join her and her husband to a very interesting party. The date was at the end of dry season and the early 1980s, and Annie said, leave plenty of time, it's a long trip. The party started at 7 p.m., so we left probably around 5 o'clock leaving time in case we wanted to stop. We started off on a freeway about an hour and a half toward Columbia. As we traveled the road, it became the, the four-way line, four-way four freeway became two lanes. At a large church, we turned right on a single lane road. We were surprised that this road was so well paved, but not well traveled. The road wound around the mountains, and many times it was very steep. I love my old 1963 Mercedes Benz, but with only it was no match for these mountains. The car had only four cylinders, and even in first gear, it was a challenge. After almost an hour and a half of driving, we finally realized we were in the middle of absolute nowhere. We started our trip. The air was hot and damp, like it is in the tropics. After an hour and a half or so, the air was cool and refreshing. We went through a cloud bank, and the air actually got kind of cold. Cold, and then we came out. And there was a spectacular view. We turned a corner, and we came to a checkpoint. This was not a government checkpoint, as many government checkpoints, many. Um, Let's see, uh, this was not a government checkpoint as the government had closed all the checkpoints between the provinces in 1975. Two men were standing at the guard post, each carrying an M16 rifle. I could not help, what kind of party was this? Why were these men armed? The men politely asked for our ideas after cross-referencing -re our license on a paper, on a clipboard, let us continue. We probably drove another 30 minutes or so, and then we came to the most beautiful homes I've ever seen. The house had white columns and marble floor. A, a gentleman parked our car, and I went inside. I glanced back at the parking lot, and I noticed there were Mercedes, Ferraris, and Maseratis, Lamborghinis, and many other expensive cars. Somehow my car stuck out as the oldest car in the parking lot. The men and women at the party were the most attractive people I've ever seen. Some of the woman, women wore beautiful gowns and the men wore fine Italian suits. I wore my Guayavera. They took my breath away. I felt transported to a distant place. It seemed that I was in a castle in Europe how different it was for an hour and a half before. The food was set up in the pyramid, every possible kind of fruit, meat, and seafood. The food was imported from every corner of the globe. Delicious alcoholic drinks, drinks were served. There were great wines. Servers walk around with all kinds of exotic food and drink. Soon I spotted Annie and Steve. I said, Annie, who are these people? Oh, she said, I forgot to tell you. This house belongs to a drug lord, and he is part of the Colombian cartel. We were introduced to the owner of the house. The owner seemed very friendly, like a very friendly person. It was clear that he was highly educated. Movies portray drug lords as thugs willing to kill anyone that gets in their way. 
I'm certain that people in those positions must protect themselves. I asked Annie why we were invited to the party. And she said, drug lords frequently try to get the press on their side. They do this by inviting the press to lavish parties. We stayed at the party for several hours and headed home. I will never forget this experience. I, I found this was the best, the food was the best I ever tasted and the people were most interesting. And she forgot to tell you <laughs> who the host was until you That's were there. That's pretty much it. Well, and that was with Annie. Yeah, she was that way. <laughs> wow. When was that? Um, I'm going to guess probably in 75, something like that. Uh -huh. Okay. All right, and still the images are, are right there in your mind. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll, ne I'll never forget that. Wow. Well, thanks for sharing. I'm glad you got back in time to yeah, share. Yeah, us. thank you. I had to work until 7, so it worked out perfect. Thank oh, you great. so much. Okay, thank you, Tom. All right, now our dessert, Margaret. <laughs> okay, I'm unmuted, so I should, am I on? Am I coming on? Can you see me? Yes? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay, I'm on. Okay. Okay, so um, my piece is called um, Pilgrim's Progress Revisited. And this is, um, there's some references to the original Pilgrim's Progress that was written in 1678. It was a religious allegory, which most of you probably know, but I'm not sure that it's in much read anymore. Um, anyway, so this is called Pilgrim's Progress Revisited. Pilgrim, that's who we are. On a journey blessed with grace, but fraught with hideous digressions and the ever-present slough of despond. Not those Plymouth Rock pilgrims escaped from tyranny, enjoying the earliest Thanksgiving in the America of Indians who offered provision. No, we are 21st century pilgrims finding a home in a pulsating, evolving, mysterious universe we can barely imagine. While for a moment in time, we are adapting, shaping, dreaming, and creating possibilities for ourselves and others. In this holiday season, glazed with national distress, we celebrate what we have been given and the joy that comes each year with the birth of the one who showed the way. True, we are challenged by our wounded planet and violence in the realm but we are not alone, not left without a glimpse of heaven, the music of angels and memories of the beloved ones who have gone before. Though not in charge, we can choose peace around a core of kindness and hope mirroring the values of our faith. We can speak truth, support the struggling, listen, learn, grow. Traveling with the power of love will in the end keep us pilgrims on the path to the celestial city. That was my take on where we are right now. Um, Thank you. Yes, what a lovely take. Yeah. It kind of related although I had written it the day before the sermon, but the sermon that he gave, that um, Ben gave last Sunday was um, again about who we are and um, getting that straight because everything else is transitory, but being children of God isn't. The rest of it is. And I was, I had written this the day before, but I was thinking it's sort of the same, you know, who are we? Mm -hmm. And um, where is our identity? Because, a lot of the identities that we think are pretty important are transitory. So anyway, um, I was trying to combine what's going on with the holiday. 
<laughs> I mean, I, you know, how do you do with that? You want to celebrate and all the joy of the season, and then you're looking at what's going on, and yeah, you just can't overlook it. It's just I wrote, I looked at the the one I did last Christmas was called Pandemic, uh, um, um, a Pandemic Christmas is what I called it, and I thought I could use that one again. Wait a minute, it doesn't fit. <laughs> the biggest problem isn't the pandemic now it's what's going on yeah. so it just didn't fit I had to do a new one and I was struggling with how to have it be positive but still be where we're at you deal with it yeah. anyway so that's what I came out with <laughs> yeah yeah uh, well well um, written and well read thank well, you thank you I, I like you know even though things are are trans transitory the, but the core values I like the Peace wrapped in uh, in kindness and right, peace, right. And, yeah, and then and those are staying. You know, those are more eternal. More a core of kindness and hope, and mirroring hope. the values of our faith. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, uh, there's a lot we can do, but even though we're not in charge, there's a lot we can do, and um, and I balance off the news with reading Christian century, Anabaptist world, things it, things where everything in there is positive. It's about what people are doing. Right, it's and, grounding you, yeah. Grounding not you in the faith yeah. 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 yeah, well, thank you very much. And I want to thank everybody for coming. We've had a delightful evening and, and thank all the readers for, for participating and, and sharing such such delights with us. Okay. Thank you, Jane, for you. organizing it. Thank you. You did a wonderful job. Absolutely. Yes, thank you so you much. All. A lot of talent. Thank you. Jean. Thank thank you. Um, um, Eloise for setting up, because um, she put work into setting this up too. And um, and Jean for all the work of everybody letting her know. And, and you know, that's a lot of, of comings and goings to get this going. So thank you so much, everybody. Yes. Yeah. And, and 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 people who didn't read anybody can read you know we're so glad some more people read this time right so I encourage more people to any doesn't you know just whatever can be whatever yeah, yeah. very enjoyable right. thank you so much enjoyable. yeah they're all treasure chests of stories just uh, everybody has to yeah. share. <laughs> all right thank you everybody okay. and good night. thank you so much yes. thank good you night. for hosting good night. Good thank you so much night. wonderful evening Yes. Yes. Bye. Thank you all.